Hello YouTubers and welcome to another Generation Behind Hi-Fi video. If you remember last month I purchased a JBL 550p subwoofer and paid just under $200 including delivery for it. If you have seen my look inside video on this subwoofer then you know I was very impressed with the construction of it. In my opinion the cabinet alone is worth the $200 price tag that I paid for it. So that got me thinking, can I upgrade this subwoofer to compete with some higher end subwoofers? The goal I have in mind is to create a very musical subwoofer that provides bass notes that are rich in detail while also having superb transient response. Full disclosure, I'm new to this DIY subwoofer building hobby, as well as using WinISD, but I did research this pretty diligently these last few weeks, and I'll try and share with you what I have learned. So if I make a fool of myself in this video, then you know why. It's because I'm a noob at this, but I'm hoping we can both learn something from this, or at least can provide you with some laughs at my expense. So let's get started. So what makes a great musical subwoofer? I think we first need to define some of the variables that help make a great musical subwoofer. For starters, I think a sealed cabinet design is a must towards achieving this goal. With a sealed cabinet design, the roll off is much smoother, which is about 12 dB per octave versus 24 dB per octave for a ported or bass reflex cabinet design. This smoother roll-off helps the subwoofer to disappear in your room and allows for easier blending with your main speakers. Sure, a ported cabinet design will play louder than a sealed cabinet design, however, when it has reached the resonant frequency, it starts to roll off much quicker, while the sealed cabinet design will continue to keep playing even the lowest of notes. I have included a graph that I found on Audio Judgment's website that helps illustrate this point. As you can see from the graph, the red line, which is the ported or bass reflex cabinet design, rolls off much steeper than the sealed cabinet design. You can also see from the graph that it continues to play even the lowest of notes while the ported cabinet design pretty much runs out of breath. Since I'm going with a sealed enclosure for this build, that means I need to find a subwoofer driver that is designed to work with this type of enclosure. So you're probably thinking, how do you do that? From my research, I found that each subwoofer driver that is marketed towards the DIY community will include some specifications with it. These specifications are called TS parameters, which are a set of electromechanical parameters that define the specified low frequency performance of a loudspeaker driver. One of those parameters is called total Q, or QTS. The value of QTS will tell us if the driver is suited for a sealed box design or a base reflex design. For my application, I will need to search for a driver that has a QTS value of greater than or equal to 0 0.4, but less than or equal to 0 0.7. Another important variable to consider is transient response. Transient response is a term used to describe a speaker or subwoofer's ability to deliver crisp dynamics without distortion or overhang on notes. A more casual definition is the speaker or subwoofer's ability to stop and start on a dime. One of the traits with a sealed box design is its internal air spring that acts like a suspension, which helps with achieving these good transients. The fact that a sealed cabinet design has a gentle roll-off slope of 12 dB per octave also helps. I took this screenshot from JL Audio's website which said, when it comes to subwoofer drivers, transient response is actually a function of accuracy in relation to time rather than frequency. In music, sounds like drum strikes and quick bass guitar pulses are good tests of a subwoofer system's transient performance. A system with good transient response will reproduce these sounds with clear, tight definition. A system with poor transient response tends to blur these sounds over time due to the speaker's inability to stop and start quickly enough to react to the signal accurately. How I interpret this information when it comes to shopping for a subwoofer driver is to look for a driver which has low inductance value, or LE, to ensure I receive good transient response. Another variable to consider is the volume of the cabinet. The volume of the cabinet will affect another TS parameter called Q. I'm going to try and explain Q as best I can, but I highly recommend reading more about Q and its effects on the TS parameters on the internet. There are hundreds of sites that go into great detail about Q and why it's an important variable to consider when building a subwoofer. The Q measurements, also known as quality factors, relate to the amount of relative damping in a loudspeaker. This damping is calculating how the suspension reacts. The better the suspension, the more in control and accurate the driver can move and recreate sound. Q measurements describe how well the driver can control its movement at the resonant frequency. Basically, each subwoofer driver has an optimal box size that will yield the best performance. 
In most cases, the recommended volume of the box or cabinet should be provided by the manufacturer of the driver. Simply put, a smaller box will provide a greater Q value and a larger box will provide a lower Q value. When you adjust the volume of the box, you are basically trying to hit certain values of QTC because these values translate into the characteristics of how the subwoofer will sound and perform. For example, a QTC of 0.5 provides perfect transients but extremely low efficiency. A QTC of 0.707 plus or minus 10% is what I have read to be the optimal number to hit as it gives good transients and a flat response with minimal cutoff. As you can see from this illustration, as the QTC increases, the transient response suffers and the efficiency increases. Basically, as QTC increases, the transient response becomes the inverse of efficiency. This is where using a program like WinISD comes in handy because it can model this data for you very quickly without you having to manually calculate each of these variables. As you can see from this example that I did in WinISD, as I change the volume of the enclosure, the total Q or QTC variable changes. I have read from several sources that you want to be careful with having a QTC value above 1.2 because this makes the subwoofer sound like a one note bass boomer. I have provided a screenshot that illustrates how increasing the QTC will have an effect on the subwoofer's frequency response. As QTC increases, the larger the bass hump before roll off. For this build, I'm gonna shoot for a QTC of 0.707 plus or minus 10%, which is also known as the Butterworth filter alignment, which provides an extremely flat response with excellent transient response without sacrificing too much efficiency. Now that I know what to look for, there's just one more variable that I have to calculate before I can shop for a new driver, and that is the volume of my cabinet. Unfortunately, this is one variable that I can't change since I will be reusing my JBL cabinet, which means I have to find a driver that will already work well with this enclosure. The first thing I need to do is calculate the internal volume of my cabinet by measuring the internal dimensions. Once I have the internal volume measured, I then have to subtract the volume of the internal brace as well as the volume that is taken up by the amplifier. Once I know what kind of internal volume that I have to work with, then I can start looking for drivers that will work with this enclosure. After spending about a half hour and carefully measuring and calculating everything, I have determined that the internal volume of my cabinet is 1.1589 cubic feet. Please keep in mind that this number does not take into account the volume that will be taken up by the motor structure of the subwoofer when it's installed in the cabinet. When I was shopping for subwoofer drivers, I noticed that some manufacturers provided this information and some did not. If you come across a driver that you're interested in that doesn't have this information, then try emailing Parts Express or the manufacturer of the driver. I did this a few times and they were nice enough to provide me with this information. I didn't want to bore you guys with a video of me inputting the TS parameters of various drivers into WinISD to see how it would model with my enclosure size. But basically it's what you have to do in order to figure out which driver will work best with your setup. WinISD is a free and useful tool that every DIYer should learn how to use. I know it helped me tremendously with this build. Just to recap, this is what I was looking for in a driver. I wanted a driver with a QTS value of between 0.4 and 0.7 because we know these are suited well for sealed enclosures. Other specifications I was looking for include low inductance, low distortion, cast basket for superior strength and vibration control, good power handling, nice excursion, and decent sensitivity. I needed something with decent sensitivity because I'll be using the original 300 watt amplifier for now but I do plan on replacing this amplifier in the future. I'm also looking for a new driver that will get me as close to my QTC target of 0.707 plus or minus 10%, so transients and sound quality wouldn't suffer. So what driver did I go with? I decided on the Creative Sound Solutions SDX10 after trying different TS parameters from various drivers in WinISD. I found the SDX10 subwoofer worked best at achieving my QTC goal. This driver contains all of the features I was looking for and I think it will sound great. When modeling this driver in WinISD, I hit a QTC value of 0.78 and there is even more room for improvement, which I will discuss in my next video. I'm going to end part one of this video series here. Hopefully this will give you some insight on how I picked what I think will be the best driver for this enclosure. I tried to touch on the main points from what I read on what to look for when modeling a subwoofer in WinISD. 
You really can spend hours and hours learning about this stuff. And I recommend reading up on it if you plan on doing something similar because it's impossible to go in great detail about this stuff in a 10 minute video. I don't know if what I did is 100% correct, but that's what I took away from what I read on the internet. And the guys over at Creative Sound Solutions were very helpful and responsive when I asked numerous noob questions. Even if I did get this wrong, I had fun doing this project, and that's really what matters. See you in part two. So long and happy listening.